information out to so many people. Um, so a little bit about myself and then we'll, we'll get going. Um, so my name is Kyle Davis. I'm a clinical psychologist. I'm originally from Oklahoma. I did my graduate training down at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Um, learned a lot more about health psychology um, during an internship at the University of California, San Diego's Department of Psychiatry. I'm getting older, about 10 years ago now, um, I moved out to Boise in 2013 and have done all sorts of things at St. Luke's um, in my time here. Um, so yeah, but most currently um, I work um, half time at St. Luke's um, Lifestyle Medicine Clinic, teach uh, a number of different um, health education kinds of classes. And then I also have a, a private practice um, where I do um, psychotherapy for insomnia um, primarily. So yeah, so anyways, um, this, uh, this the, a little bit of history on this emotional eating class. I mean, emotional eating is such a prevalent issue and causes lots of people problems. Um, specifically in the lifestyle medicine program that we wanted to put together a class um, fo focused on emotional eating and how to cope with that. Um, that has evolved into a four-week series um, that I'm teaching now called the Psychology of Eating series, um, where I have four classes that each last an hour and still don't feel like I have nearly enough time to cover everything that could potentially be helpful to folks. Um, so in today's presentation, I'm trying to um, condense that down um, to about 30 minutes. So if you don't get all the answers you're looking for, uh, don't be surprised. It's hard to teach um, everything or somebody everything they would need to know about how to change um, what are for many people lifelong patterns of eating um, in, in 30 minutes. Um, but we can definitely give you some ideas about things that can be helpful. Um, so today um, we'll be talking about how um, emotional eating develops. Um, we'll be talking about how to recognize the difference between um, um, like emotional hunger um, versus physical hunger. Um, we'll talk about um, finding some of your own triggers for emotional eating. And then we'll talk about some different strategies that you can use to cope with emotional eating. Um, I will also do my best to try to manage the chat box um, throughout the presentation. If you have specific questions, um, feel free to type them in. Like I said, I'll try to answer them in stride. Um, but if I can't, um, that way we'll have them um, so we can talk about them at the end of the class. All right, so what do I mean when I say emotional eating? I, I use a really broad definition of emotional eating and think of it as really eating for um, really any reason other than physical hunger. And if you look closely enough, you'll probably find some emotion that's getting associated with that. Um, really common experiences would be people that were eating whenever they felt lonely or isolated. Maybe they're feeling anxious, um, down, depressed, irritable, angry, and we even eat whenever um, we're celebrating or we feel euphoric. And so um, eating can take on all these different associations other than um, physical hunger. Um, whenever I was putting this presentation together, initially, we were at the beginning of the pandemic first chapter, and I've, I came across this headline in the Huffington Post um, talking about um, emotional eating in um, the Japanese culture and how they have a, a word that's a really good fit for it. I'm not going to um, butcher that um, right now, but the translation is um, lonely mouth or longing to have or put something in some or in one's mouth. Um, and I just thought it was important to bring up that, you know, emotional eating cuts across um, cultures. It's certainly not a uniquely uh, American um, situation. And I, I've got to think that as long as um, humans have been around, if they had excess food on hand, um, there probably has been some form of emotional eating uh, going on. So this is, and, and we'll talk about why that is so easy um, for people to fall into a little bit later on. So I like to give people an idea of where they're at in this uh, spectrum of emotional eating. Um, I'm going to go through this survey pretty quickly. Um, it could be helpful for you to jot down um, responses um, to these questions. Um, I would score these as um, never answers would be zeros. Sometimes answers would be ones. Generally, answers would be two. And always, um, responses would be scored as threes. Um, so write down your answers as we go through this, and you can add them up to see where you would fall on the spectrum of emotional eating. Um, and also, I'll point out, this was translated from another language, so if the wording is a little funky, that's why. Um, okay, so number one, do the weight scales have a great power over you? Can they change your mood? In other words, um, if the scale's not going the direction you want it to, does it ruin your day? 
Um, so never, sometimes, generally, or always. Number two, do you crave specific foods? Once again, never, sometimes, generally, and always. Three, is it difficult for you to stop eating sweet things, especially chocolate? Four, do you have problems controlling the amount of certain types of food you eat? Five, do you eat when you are stressed, angry, or bored? Six, do you eat more of your favorite food and with less control when you are alone? Seven, do you feel guilty when you eat forbidden foods like sweets or snacks? Number eight, do you feel less control over your diet when you are tired after work at night? Nine, when you overeat while on a diet, do you give up and start eating without control, particularly food that you think is fattening? And 10, how often do you feel that food controls you rather than you controlling food? So go ahead and add up your responses and I'm gonna make up some categories. Um, we'll say zero to 10 is our low range. Um, 10 to 20 scores are our mild range and 20, 30 um, scores would be our moderate to high range. Um, I am curious to know, type in the chat box and let me know where you fall on that spectrum. I wish I had a cool survey um, to fill out. I, I really wasn't anticipating having so many people here. Uh, but yeah, where do you fall on the scale? Uh, Michael, you can't top out the scale. You can't, you can't be twice as high. Okay, yeah, so it looks like we're getting a range of scores. I'm not, I, I really wish I could sit and look at all of them, um, but I, I think it's important for people to know where they're at on the spectrum. Also wanna point out here, you know, you're looking at these questions, you probably are thinking, you know what, everybody, um, you know, probably does this um, to, to some extent. And I think that that's totally true. I mean, you think about something like, you feel less control over your diet when you're tired, do you crave specific foods at times? Um, you know, these are gonna be really common um, experiences for people. Um, so once again, you know, this operates in a spectrum like most things do. Um, but once again, it can be super helpful to know where you're at on that spectrum. Cause that could indicate if you wanna seek additional um, help for that. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how emotional eating develops. And um, there are probably lots of reasons that people that fall into these kinds of patterns of emotional eating. Um, on one hand, emotional eating is a, a be learned behavior that gets reinforced over time. Um, emotional eating is also reinforced physiologically and emotional eating may develop as a coping strategy for stress um, and be reinforced as a learned behavior and physio physiologically. So let's take a closer look at how those things happen. So emotional eating as a learned behavior. Um, so emotional eating can occur in response to different thoughts, feelings, behaviors, different environments. Um, and so just uh, to get you thinking about this, you know, think about like what, what comes to mind when you think about walking into a movie theater um, other than um, contracting COVID um, right now. Um, but let's, let's go to pre-COVID times and you walk into a movie theater, um, what, what are you thinking about as soon as you walk in the doors? Um, and you can use the chat box um, to respond here. So Lynette's quick, um, she said popcorn and soda, of course, Kyle, um, popcorn, candy, sodas. Um, you know, we have these strong behavioral associations, um, you know, with being in those kinds of situations. Wow, yeah, we've even got the, <laughs> the gist for it. Um, okay, what do you think of when you think about a birthday party? Um, yeah, you're sneaking your own treats in. Um, okay, uh, another one for y'all. What do you think about if you're at a baseball game? Um, and I, of course, you know, I've got you all primed to be thinking about um, food and eating right now. But even if we weren't, you know, you run into a stranger on the street and they ask you, what do you think about a birthday party? And you think about cake and ice cream. Um, it's the first thing that comes to mind. Um, you know, same things with these different sporting events. Um, Wow, you're, you're, thanks for the survey, Michael. Um, and then, uh, you know, and then you think about, we even have like specific associations um, with different restaurants. You think about going to Olive Garden or something like that. People are like unlimited breadsticks, soups and salads, um, you know, or, or wine sometimes people say. Uh, so we just have these really strong associations that develop. Um, 
another, so, you know, obviously these different situations get connected with food really easily. Um, we also have different thought patterns that get associated um, with eating. Um, so this is something that y'all can think about, you know, maybe type in the chat box if you're aware, aware of this stuff. Um, you know, but the kinds of thoughts that are oftentimes going through their mind or going through people's minds when they find themselves eating for reasons other than hunger are, they're like, well, just one more won't matter. Um, if it's here, I might as well eat it. Um, I'll hurt that person's feelings if I don't eat this. Um, you know, I can start eating healthier um, tomorrow, next week, um, something like that. Or, you know, we say just a little bit, you know, and these are like um, giving ourselves um, permission, you know, but it, it's also like these associations that have developed between the thought and eating. So you, um, you know, whenever you have that thought pop into your head, um, you have associated that with eating. Um, yeah. And so a couple of you are pointing to a really common one, like I deserve it. Um, you know, like I had a bad day. I deserve to eat this. I just finished my workout. I deserve this. Um, and so, oh yeah, I've already, I balanced this out with a salad. Um, you know, I've already had, I've already ate this healthy thing. So now I can eat the other thing. Um, yeah. So just so you can see like how many different patterns I'm developed with this stuff. And then um, we think about emotional associations. Um, you know, it's so like I was saying earlier, um, and, I, and I'll ask you all again too, um, what kinds of emotions have you associated with eating? If I were feeling this way, I would be more likely to be eating um, emotionally or for reasons other than hunger. Um, so, you know, once again, depressed, lonely, anxious, angry, happy, um, you know, these are all um, really common types of associations that people develop. Hey, there's my old, my old buddy, Lisa. Okay, yeah, so yeah, we have these associations like food is love. Um, you eat when you're feeling sad, bored. I think boredom is a really big one, Michael. Um, feeling tired, feeling overwhelmed, um, you know, feeling like you're in pain, you're stressed out. Um, you know, <laughs> you're my friend from a long time ago, Lisa, uh, since I started at St. Luke's. Um, okay, so, so we've got all these different associations that develop situations, um, different behaviors, um, different thought patterns, different emotions, and we learn to eat in response to all those different things. And the more you engage in a behavior in response to a stimulus, the more likely it is that that's hap that will happen again. You're like creating a pathway in your brain. You're creating an association um, between that stimulus and the behavior of eating. Um, so you can probably tell, you know, that my little cartoons here um, are trying to get at that. Um, you know, Pavlov's dogs were trained to salivate at the sound of a bell ringing. Um, and you've developed associations with food in response to these other kinds of patterns, just like Pavlov's dogs, or like the cartoon says, Pavlov was trained to write in his little book um, every time the dog salivated. So one thing that you may not be thinking about as much is how emotional eating gets reinforced um, physiologically. So when people experience um, increased stress, their hunger hormones increase, and their satiety hormones decrease. So satiety hormones are um, hormones that make you feel full. Why do you think your bodies would react that way? If you were experiencing more stress, why would your body want to eat more food? Um, why would your body be craving those kinds of things or your brain um, be craving those kinds of things? Uh... All right, somebody took control of the presentation. Um, let me get us back on track. Somebody is sharing their screen of me right now. Me? I'm not doing that. Um, I don't know who me is. There's over 100 people on this call. Um, but give me a second and I'll get us back. Kyle, I think if you just try to share your screen, it should override that. Yeah, I just have to select the right presentation again. Thanks for your help, Erin.
Hi, it's not wanting to let me share that again. Now I keep running into problems with teams um, working from home since we have new security um, in place, but it was obviously working just a second ago. Um, so Jasmine, is there any way that you can work on that while I try to uh, move on without? Uh, Jasmine, sure, yeah. Kyle's presentation. Yeah, I have it and I, I can share my screen in just a minute. I can try one more time. OK, that's good enough. Boom, we're in. OK, yeah, so we're li just looking at the PDF, but it still accomplishes the, the same thing. Um, and I'll just yeah ask you to move forward in a, a second. Um, so let's see what people are saying. Why would our bodies crave more food and be less satisfied? Um, well, I'm not probably not going to be able to <laughs> read all of them. Um, so the, the main reason why is, you know, anytime you think about why your body responds in a certain way, a good answer is likely your survival. Um, so if we think about how we've evolved, um, if we're in some sort of stressful circumstance, having more calories on board um, gives us probably a better opportunity for survival in the future. So our body will turn to food as a way to store up calories to be able to um, cope with whatever's coming in front of us. So eating also causes small amounts of neurotransmitters like dopamine to be released that give us a feeling of satisfaction and pleasure. So the question here is, what foods do you think would cause the greatest amount of dopamine to be released and why? What do you all think about that one? Why would you crave? Yeah, so what foods are gonna give you the most um, dopamine release? Yeah, so foods that are <laughs> sugar and tacos, I like that one. Uh, so um, foods that are high in sugar, um, high in fat, calorie dense kinds of foods that are readily available for your body to use. Um, that's what it wants. Um, you're not gonna be, probably not gonna find yourself craving carrots and celery and broccoli and apples um, in these situations. Um, you're gonna be craving foods um, that are the, the high calorie, um, high sugar, high fat kinds of foods. Once again, um, because it gives you more of those um, uh, energy that you could use um, to survive and that gets easily converted into to fat. Um, all right, next slide, please. All right, so what we're looking at here is, uh, I lost all my, my cool animations, um, but uh, the, CB, the cognitive behavioral therapy model and how it applies to what we're talking about. So the cognitive behavioral therapy model says that we're going to be exposed to all sorts of different situations um, in our lifetime. And um, in response to those different situations that we face, we'll experience different thought patterns that arise from them. Um, whenever we have these different thoughts, um, we often time our thoughts are going to influence our feelings um, and they're going to influence our behaviors. Our, how we're feeling is going to influence our thoughts and behaviors and our behaviors are also going to influence our thoughts um, and feelings. So we've got a lot of different bi-directional um, relationships here. Um, and so you can see, once again, how all these different associations um, can occur um, with eating emotionally. All right, next slide. So what are we going to do about all this? Um, you know, you're probably getting some insight into different patterns that you've developed over time, uh, different things that can get you into trouble. Um, so what can we do about this? So the first step is starting to recognize um, when you are um, feeling physically hungry versus when you may be eating for an emotional reason. And if you can identify these things, um, then that gives you an opportunity to do something differently about it. So physical hunger comes on really gradually, like emotional hunger comes on really suddenly. Like if I started talking about candy bars right now and you started feeling hungry, um, that would be a sign of uh, emotional hunger. Um, when we're experiencing physical hunger, we're open to eating all different kinds of foods. Um, and emotional hunger is usually for a, a really specific kind of food or craving something. Um, you know, if you've ever seen the show, like, or Survivor or Alone, you know, you think about the kinds of things these people end up eating when they're really hungry. Um, you know, they are very open to all different kinds of foods. Um, 
physical hunger is based in the stomach. We think of emotional hunger as being above the neck um, or having more of a, a psychological um, connection. Um, physical hunger kind of comes on slowly. We're emotional, our eating for emotional reasons feel really urgent. Um, physical hunger occurs out of physical need. Emotional hunger is oftentimes paired with an upsetting emotion. Physical hunger can involve um, deliberate choice and awareness of eating or emotional eating um, becomes absent minded pretty easily um, or automatic physical hunger. Um, hopefully we stop eating when we're full or we're not hungry anymore. Um, where we, for emotional reasons, oftentimes we're not paying attention to those um, satiety cues at all. And in physical hunger, um, we're eating for necessary reasons and um, emotional hunger, we oftentimes feel pretty um, guilty um, afterwards. So if you're feeling guilty after what you're eating, um, there's a really good chance that you're eating for um, some uh, emotional reasons, all right? Um, next slide, please. So um, whenever I'm teaching this class in a longer format, um, I try to get participants to start naming um, different connections that they've noticed with food. So different situations, different thoughts, feelings, behaviors. Because um, once again, naming these things uh, can be super helpful in learning your, your own associations. Um, you know, you can take a stab at that in the chat box, but once again, I'm, I'm running out of time, so I won't be able to, to comment on or very many of them. Um, all right, next slide, please. <laughs> but I, I like the, the ones that I'm seeing already. Yeah, feeling hangry. Uh, Robert, that could very well be for some physical hunger um, reasons too. Um, you know, if you're, you start feeling more irritable um, and you just need to eat, um, that may, yeah, that could actually be a cue for physical hunger. Um, but yeah, Michael's talking about my kids are in bed and quiet. Yeah, extended family interactions. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so we, we make different decisions in different kinds of situations to help ourselves um, cope. So what can we do with all this? Um, so this is not by far, this is definitely not an exhaustive list of things that people can do. And I also, you know, don't want to oversimplify this stuff. Um, it's a lot easier said than done. Um, you know, most people need to give this like multiple iterations, you know, before it starts um, clicking, you try different things out. You do them over and over again. It's helpful to have feedback when you're working with somebody like myself, um, you know, to make these changes. But um, a lot of this stuff is going to be the same, you know, um, whether you're working with a professional or, or trying it on your own. Um, so um, first up, mindfulness. Um, this is one that I am probably doing a big disservice to by just saying be mindful about when you're eating because, geez, you could spend the rest of your life um, learning mindfulness and people that do that regularly meditate um, totally understand that, you know, it's a lifelong practice. Um, but when we're talking about mindful eating, all we're the main thing we're talking about is checking in with ourselves and saying like, what's going on in, with myself currently? Why am I eating right now? Um, is this emotionally, um, am I, you know, craving foods for emotional reasons or is this more of, um, from a place of physical hunger? So you're just checking in with yourself um, before you decide whether or not you're going to eat. Um, so another thing, this is probably one of the most straightforward, helpful ones, and it sounds too, too easy, but uh, man, it sure can be helpful. Um, so changing your environment. And these are things like you, somebody was talking about like Taco Bell earlier, you know that that's a weakness for you. When you drive home from work and you're really tired, um, you know, Taco Bell starts calling you, um, then you may choose to drive home a different way. Um, driving home a different way um, avoids that um, association with that, makes it more difficult for you to, to go there. Um, and so literally changing the way that you're driving, avoiding that cue um, can be super helpful. Um, even more specific than that is really try hard not to bring unhelpful foods into your house. And if they are in your house, um, put them in a place that, um, that you wouldn't normally keep food. Um, make it more difficult for you to access it. Like I've got people um, that are keeping their, uh, the kids, the grandkids snacks in their garage or in a closet somewhere that they wouldn't normally go to. Um, Cause people say, well, you know, I need these foods in the house for my kids or grandkids or my spouse or, you know, these other people, I don't want to be eating them, but they're there. And then I end up eating them. And so putting them in a different place and literally making it harder for you to access them, 
uh, can go a long ways and also make you pause a little bit more before you would um, eat them. Um, doing things like engaging in a competing behavior. Um, this is also really straightforward and can be really helpful. I would venture to say, you know, if we were looking at most of your um, patterns of emotional eating, a lot of this is occurring in the evening, um, in the time between you eat dinner and the time that you go to bed. Um, finding a competing behavior um, to, to engage in during this time can be super helpful in preventing yourself from eating for other reasons. So something like um, chewing gum, um, drinking a big glass of water. Um, one of the more helpful strategies I've heard people talk about is brushing their teeth. Um, they brush their teeth extra early. Um, as soon as they finish their dinner, they brush their teeth. Um, one of my most um, <laughs> successful stories of this was somebody who was brushing their teeth. They're using a ton of mouthwash and making their mouth like super minty. And all the foods that they would crave otherwise um, certainly weren't so appealing um, when their mouth was like super fresh. Um, and then doing something um, like I have a silly example here, playing a harmonica. Um, but something that occupies your mouth um, makes it really hard to eat something else. Same thing with your hands. Even if you're like knitting or you're playing guitar, um, you know, something like that makes it really hard to eat um, whenever you're, you're doing it. Or like Colleen saying, eating sunflower seeds. Um, so, yeah, and Julia is saying that she does the same thing, you know, that brushes her teeth after lunch to watch out for, for snacking. Um, so these are really straightforward stuff that can go uh, a long ways. It's just being super intentional about it is what makes or helps people make progress. Um, using your support system. So many people feel that they are alone, that these are like their own patterns. You know, you can see in this room, we've got like 130 people here right now. These are 130 of your colleagues and peers that are struggling with the same kinds of things that, that you are. Um, you know, you're not a, alone in dealing with this. And so being open about different patterns that you're trying to change um, can be really helpful. You know, talking to a coworker, um, a friend, family member, um, you know, somebody that you can text, um, send a Teams message to um, and say, send a, send a Teams message to me and say, Kyle, I was just thinking about eating those cookies in the break room, but I thought about your class and I didn't do it. And I'll give you a, a, a smiley face or a thumbs up. Um, so, you know, asking for support, um, you know, can be really helpful. And just knowing that there are other people out there that care and can help, um, help you have some accountability for what you're working on. Um, creating new patterns. Many of you know exactly, you know, where your downfalls are when it comes to emotional eating. And so doing something really intentional like being really proactive about meal planning for the week um, can help um, somebody, you know, avoid these patterns. So we're being proactive and we do this kind of stuff um, to head off the unhelpful um, eating later on. So meal planning, meal preparation, um, getting some of that stuff done in advance uh, makes it a lot easier for you to make healthy decisions. Changing thoughts about food. This one is much easier said than done. Um, this is why I developed a, a four-week series <laughs> called The Psychology of Eating, um, you know, where we, we talk in depth about how to change um, patterns around, thought patterns around food. Um, but ideally, we're helping people view food as a source of fuel um, rather than as a, a source of pleasure. Um, we want people to be thinking about food um, for what it is other than these other kinds of associations that it can take on. And then our... Our last um, strategy here, um, oh, actually, I forgot one that I love um, with mindfulness, um, asking yourself the question, um, would I eat an apple right now um, is a great way to see if you're um, eating for emotional hunger or physical hunger. Um, you know, like have healthy snacks with you. Ask yourself if an apple is going to um, satisfy you in that moment or, or some other kind of healthy snack. And then if the answer is no, that's a clear sign that you would be eating for a reason other than physical hunger. And then our, um, our last one here, urge surfing. Um, anytime we're experiencing physio physiological cravings for things, um, whether it's um, tobacco, alcohol, other drugs, food, our craving for that um, operates in a pretty predictable kind of way. Um, you'll think about it and you'll start, uh, start craving it, craving it, craving it but eventually your craving will plateau. It will not just increase until your head explodes. It's going to plateau at a certain point and then it will drop off. Um, and so if you can sit with those urges for long enough and watch them, they will plateau and they will drop. 
the the thing is most people are going to give in to that craving well before they reach a plateau and it starts to decrease but if you can watch that process you will learn um, that it will go down and you can manage it um, by waiting it out or distracting yourself in the meantime um, so if you give yourself an opportunity to do that oftentimes people will learn um, that that um, that it will go away um, all right next um, I think we're just about done. Yeah, so now I can start looking at the chat box and answering questions that people have. Um, if you're looking for other resources to deal or cope with emotional eating, I've got a couple um, book references here um, that you can um, look up on your own. You know, these are the kinds of books that you can find for like 15 bucks on Amazon. Um, so these are great um, self-help resources. And then of course I will also um, plug the lifestyle medicine program, you know, that the people in the program um, are no different than the people in, in this class right now. Um, you know, we, we help people um, develop healthier lifestyles. And a big part of that is changing uh, unhelpful eating patterns. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about that, um, you know, definitely um, look into the lifestyle medicine program. You could potentially um, take my psychology of eating class in the future. Um, and yeah, we'd love to be able to, to help you out if you're interested in um, and participating. So I'll turn my attention um, back to the chat box and start answering questions. Also, I forgot um, Jasmine's request at the beginning of this to let you all know that this is being recorded and will be um, hosted on their, oh, the page, uh, what, what do you call it, Jasmine? The uh, Lifestyle Medicine Stream Channel. Stream channel. That's what I was missing. Yeah. Okay. Let me see what people are asking. Okay. Adrian, Adriana says, what can I do when I'm a multi-generational caregiver? Work full-time, working on my master's degree, always worried or stress, fast food. Yeah. Adriana, I mean, that's a tough spot to be in. I think the answer in these kinds of situations is um, planning ahead um, because if you're just winging it, it's really hard. Um, to make um, healthy choices. But if you have time where you can um, be sit down and do some meal planning, I think that's what it usually comes down to is. And then also, you know, thinking about how you prioritize your own health um, within all of your obligations. And I know a lot of people have a tendency to put themselves last um, whenever they have lots of other obligations. And I think the question to ask yourself is, could you do an even better job of helping other people in your life and taking care of all of your obligations if you were doing a better job of taking care of yourself? Um, and so I, I think that's, you know, that can be a, a helpful way to think about it. And most people find that the better they're taking care of them own self or their own selves, um, the better they can be at helping other people as well. Um, Catherine says, I mask my severe daily chronic back with food. It makes me feel good during how to fix it. You're, yeah, it sounds like you're distracting yourself, Catherine, um, with food. Um, I would love to talk to you about other options um, for managing chronic pain. Um, I actually teach a class called Empowered um, Relief, um, which is a two-hour um, pain program where we talk about managing chronic pain. Um, so in your situation, I would say, Let's look into situ or different things that you can do to manage chronic pain um, versus just how do I not eat in these situations? Um, and also, um, I'm teaching that class on Friday morning for free virtually from 9 to 11. Um, let me pull up a link and I'll throw it in the chat box if anybody else out there has, has issues with chronic pain. Um, I know I just sent this earlier, so it's it's already in my browser. So the, the link I just put in the chat box is for um, this Empowered Relief program. I teach it for St. Luke's, um, but we charge money for it. Um, this one I'm doing in the community is actually free. Okay, so let me see what else is up here. Um, food is constantly used as an incentive or language. Yeah, you're right, Tara. Um, that's how those associations um, develop. Let's see. Sometimes my phone's better at seeing the what's coming in on Teams than my browser. Yeah, 
Yeah, Heather, you know that about yourself, um, you know, and if you know that about yourself, well, then that, you know, we can view these as opportunities, um, but to potentially do something different in the future, you know what is likely to get you into to trouble. But, you know, just because you have those personality traits definitely does not mean that you can't um, do something differently in the future. I think you've answered all of them there, doctor. Oh, cool, Heather. Yeah, I mean, just knowing that about yourself, um, you know, and starting to think about it differently um, can really free you up to, um, to, to start changing those patterns. It's like one more from Nicole. Why is it yeah. when you, okay. This is I can see him. Um, oh, perfect. I have a good plan and things are going well. All of a sudden there's an urge to eat and not stop. Ooh, wow. Yeah, that's getting into interesting stuff. Um, I, I think a lot of people, if you think about the stories that you tell yourself in your head, um, many of us have like these narratives. Um, they, they're not always narratives that we want for ourselves, but they exist. And, you know, people will have this belief that they cannot be successful in changing um, eating patterns. Um, and so they can get into these, you know, patterns where they do pretty well for a while, um, but then they fall off the wagon or they feel like they're self-sabotaging. I think a big part of that is, is that there's a real tendency to try to continue that narrative um, that things aren't going to work and that you're not going to be successful. And so there's like this unconscious desire to engage in self-sabotaging kind of behavior. Um, it's definitely something that people can overcome. Um, but I think that that is one of the big reasons, you know, that people um, fall into those um, situations, like everything's going well, and then you just fall off the wagon for some reason. Um, all right, let's see what else people are saying. Yeah, so once again, you know, um, changing these patterns um, can be really difficult. And so, you know, like working with somebody like myself, um, you know, a, a therapist who is familiar um, with strategies for dealing with emotional eating, um, you know, on the, the further end of emotional eating is binge eating disorder, um, you know, and so um, you can go a little bit deeper and try to figure out, you know, what may be driving some of that behavior. Lynette has a point, you know, it's like a lot of times when people are eating healthier, they do feel like they're depriving themselves in some way. And if people are feeling like they're deprived, um, it's probably not going to be that sustainable. Um, and so I know we work hard at lifestyle medicine and we talk about substituting things other than depriving yourself of something, because usually people are just thinking about it and then they get more stressed and they give in um, and then they feel bad about it. And it's the back to the, the same old pattern. Ooh, yeah, how to get connected with a practitioner in this area. You know, I think some of our, our dietitians in the community are probably pretty savvy about this. I know I saw Liz, Liz um, on the call earlier, at least one dietitian I know that works for St. Luke's, so though I, I don't think that, or that not everybody could work with her. Um, you know, I know some of our health coaches in the system are some, some are probably more familiar with this stuff than others. Um, and then, um, yeah, like, you know, myself, and I, I don't really know that many therapists in the community that would be really um, well versed in this stuff. That doesn't mean they don't exist. Um, you know, I'm, I'm also a potential resource in my um, private practice. And of course, also in the within the lifestyle medicine program as well.
And then there, I, I know like one certification you could look for, I mean, like dietitians, a popular program is like intuitive eating, um, where it's more of a mindfulness based take on um, eating the, or changing the way you're eating. Um, so if you look for folks um, that are certified or trained in the intuitive eating program, um, that, that could be a helpful resource. All right, any other questions? Yeah, don't be shy. I'm, my next patient's not for 20 minutes. So <laughs> if you have a question, um, feel, free to, feel free to ask. Yeah, my pleasure, everyone. It's cool to see some of these uh, old people from my my old old jobs at St. Luke's, like Lisa. You all are very welcome. Ooh, Christina, do I think intermittent fasting increases emotional eating? Um, I don't know. It probably increases your cravings for physical hunger. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if it would make you, I think that's probably a situation where you would really want to focus on alternative um, behavior strategies that you could use um, because you're also dealing with physical hunger. You know, if you're doing some fasting, especially until you get um, like used to that kind of pattern of eating. Um, and so that's where I would put my efforts is like distraction um, you know, like competing behaviors that um, do not involve eating, um, because that's a, a, a difficult one to, to change. Um, oh, interesting. Cool, Rhonda. So you, you fast and you found that it's helped with your cravings. I mean, if nothing else, you know, it's kind of learning like what I was talking about with urge surfing. Um, you know, you're going to feel hungry. Um, and you learn that you, that those feelings will pass, even, um, you know, physical hunger will pass temporarily until it comes back around. Um, and so if you learn that you can tolerate those urges, uh, then if you're experiencing urges in other areas for eating, like for emotional reasons, um, then you're going to be better prepared for that, um, when you experience them. So yeah, that's a, that's an interesting uh, take that I hadn't really thought of before. Um, let me see what this other one is that I'm going to see if I can see what you posted with that. Okay. So there's a question. My husband is diabetic and he can be grumpy when he's hungry and blames it on his sugars and being diabetic. Is this a true fact or is it considered emotional? Uh, it's hard to say. I think it could be either. Um, you know, we can, we can always make that our scapegoat anytime you're irritable. Um, you could say, oh, sorry, I'm just hungry, um, which, you know, could be a cop out um, or it could be totally legitimate. Um, I would maybe you um, <laughs> you make a measure his blood sugar um, whenever he says that. And then you could actually see what his blood sugar was at and then see if it's associated with being grumpy or not. It could be a, a lot of other things, you know, that is making somebody feel grumpy.
And in that case, you could actually look at his blood sugar, which would be really interesting. So you don't have permission um, to do that unless your blood sugar is below like a certain cutoff. Thanks, Robert. Yeah. I definitely think, you know, feeling hangry or irritable when you're hungry is definitely a real thing. I mean, I, I think I experienced that too. Um, but it, it would be easy to blame anytime you felt grumpy on the, on that. 